Well, good morning, South Union. Welcome to each and every one of you who are here with us today. Welcome to all of our guests. Welcome to all of our regular attenders and to our members. Welcome to all those who are listening in online, now or at a later time. Welcome. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Our Father, we glorify you and we thank you that you are God Almighty, King of heaven and earth. We thank you. We thank you that all things are in your hands. We thank you so very much for your precious Son, Jesus Christ, for him crucified and resurrected. We thank you, Jesus, for the fact that you are alive and well and seated on the throne, ruling over God's kingdom. We thank you. Father in Jesus, we thank you so very much for your Holy Spirit, who is here with us and among us dwelling in us as believers and dwelling in your church as a community, we thank you. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being able to worship you. And now, Lord, we turn our eyes and our hearts and our minds to your word. Father, we pray that you would bless the exposition of it. We pray that you would teach us rebuke us, correct us, and train us in righteousness. We pray that this might be our food for our souls. Lord Jesus, come. In your name do we pray. Amen. We are all God's children after all. A radio or television host or hostess might say, speaking about the entirety of the human race. Is that true? What does it mean to be a child of God? And as one of our focus points for today, what is the Holy Spirit's role in our adoption as children of God? By the end of the sermon, I pray that you will have a greater knowledge of what it means to be a child of God, the Holy Spirit's role in our adoption, and I pray that you will rejoice and praise God for this blessed truth. Now, before we dive into our passage, I just want to take a moment and speak on a uh, very short subject. I'm not going to explain it. I will simply state it. We worship a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God, three persons. Whenever one person of the Trinity acts, the entire Trinity is acting. However, actions are usually attributed to one person of the Trinity such that they are in the foreground of the action. So what do I mean by that? A practical example, the Father is usually associated with creation. But what do we know? Well, we know from Genesis 1 that the Spirit was hovering over the void, hovering over the depths. We know from John 1 and we know from Colossians that Jesus was the means by which all things were created. And yet, usually the Father is attributed with creation. He is the creator. Here in this text, then, we understand that the Holy Spirit is the one who adopts. He is the spirit of adoption. The entire Trinity is at work, yet the Holy Spirit is the one whom it is attributed to. A second important question that this text doesn't deal with for us today is how do we become a child of God? There is only one way in which we become a child of God, and that is through belief in Jesus Christ. That's it. That's the one way to become a child. By God's grace, 
through faith in Jesus Christ. When we confess with our lips and believe in our hearts, we are born again. Now, I usually give a much broader gospel presentation, but that's not the focus. The focus is to simply state those things quickly and move into our text for today, knowing that the point of focusing in our text for today, there is a lot here in Romans 8, 12 through 17. We'll actually be coming back to it next week because there's so much here. The point of today is we're focusing in on this adoption theme and what it means to be a child of God. So let's take a look here at Romans 8, verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. And so then we have to understand here, this is almost like a validity text. How do you know that you are a child of God? How do you know that you are a son or daughter of God? Well, it's because you are led by the Holy Spirit. Then the next question that we naturally ask is, well, what does it actually mean to be led by the Holy Spirit? In context here, and this is one of the reasons why verses 12 and 13 are important to read, we have that four there in verse 14. In verses 12 and 13, what we find is that the context is one of living righteously. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So the context is, if you are led to live righteously, if you are being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, Romans uh, 8 verse, I'm losing it, Romans 8 verse, hmm? 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So if we're being conformed to the image of Christ, if we're living righteously, if we are becoming more righteous, if we are becoming more holy, then we are being led by the Spirit of God. It's in the overarching part of our life. We are being led into righteousness. More on that next week. But for today, I also want to focus on this adoption theme. And the text here says this, All who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Let's pick up in verse 15 as well. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So what does it mean to be a child of God, a son of God? Well, here what we're seeing is that it's intimately related with having a real relationship with God, such that we call him Father. God is not simply a distant God, as if we simply refer to him all the time as just God. But no, there's something that wells up inside of us by which we say, Father. Oh, this is not a litmus test. This is not to change necessarily but what we do. But when we're talking to somebody, or if we find ourselves always in a position of saying, well, I pray to God. Well, I talk with, and, and all we mean by that is we ask God for certain things, and the title is always God. Then something's probably wrong in our relationship with Him. There is an intimacy associated that the Spirit gives us. He has us cry, Abba, Father. There is something distinct and different. There is something that has changed. So that is one part of being a child of God, is we have that intimate relationship with Him. And yet this phrase here that we find in verse 14, sons of God, 
And as we look then into verses 15 and even on to 16, we have children of God. What does this mean? What's the point? There are actually two different contexts, and one of the reasons why the ESV translates sons of God in verse 14 is there's two different contexts in which Paul is referencing and referring and believing that you already know as you come to the text. Remember, he's writing to first century people who are in Rome. There's two contexts. One is the ancient Roman context. And the second is the context of the Old Testament. So you have two contexts there to look at. So let's take a look and see what this means. The sons of God, when we're translating that, the intent is not exclusive as if it's always male. The, 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 the intent is a signaling of children of God, male and female. However, within Roman society, adoption usually happened just among or for males. People would adopt a son into their family. This adoption had three major components. One, it meant you were legally estranged from your family of birth and immersed in a new family. Two, all debts accrued were canceled. Three, the adopted son becomes the heir apparent in the family. Now, this is actually highly relevant for our spiritual lives. It's highly relevant for what happens to us when we become children of God. So let's take a look at this one by one. First, we are estranged spiritually from our previous family. And the question is, what is our previous family? Previous family is actually the kingdom of darkness where the devil is our father, where we are children of the serpent from Genesis 3. Turn with me to John chapter 8, verse 44. John chapter 8, verse 44. When we're in John chapter 8, verse 44, what we actually find is that Jesus is arguing with a group of Jews. And the Jews are saying, well, Abraham is our father. They're claiming to be the people of God based on physical ancestry. And in verse, 40, uh, verse 44, Jesus says this to them in response. Actually, let's just back up to verse 42. We'll read Jesus' entire response to them. Jesus said to them, if God were your father... You would love me, for I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? That's not a rhetorical question. He's about to explain to them why they don't understand. It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. What's Jesus doing there? He's planting in the ground a banner, and that banner is himself. All who gather to him in faith are in Christ. All who are with him are children of God. Guess who everyone else is not? Everyone else is not a child of God. So who's their father? The devil. Spiritually speaking, of course. Turn with me to John chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. 
This explains it from another way and another perspective. John chapter 1, you're in the introduction of John. And here's what, Jesus, here's what John writes about Jesus. But to all who did receive him, that's Jesus, all who did receive Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the question has to be asked, if we have to be given the right to become children of God, what were we to begin with? Not children of God is the answer. Only those who believe in Jesus become children of God. And that is a specific part of the historical context. When you are a son and you are adopted into the family, you are estranged from your family of birth and brought into a new one. Guess what? When you believe in Christ, you are estranged from your spiritual old family, that kingdom of darkness, and you were brought into the kingdom of light. You become a child of God. Number two, when you enter into your new family, all your debts accrued were canceled. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14 simply tell this truth so clearly. Let's turn there. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, spiritually old family, dead in trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal command, demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities, put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Praise God. When we are adopted as children of God, we come into this family, into a new family uh, of Jesus Christ with God our Father. And we have all of our debt canceled. All of the sin is forgiven. It's all been nailed right to the cross. Praise God. Now, with this new family and with our debts being canceled, we then also find ourselves in a place, and this is not the emphasis for today, but when we are children of God, we've also come into a new family. That's the church. The church triumphant throughout the ages and the church as a body of believers. All who believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, all who are born again are brothers and sisters with one another. Folks, look around. That means everyone who is born again, all believers here today, are a family with one another. And finally, we all have a new inheritance together. We all become, uh, we're not necessarily the heir apparent, we're going to talk about that, but we, come, but we become fellow heirs. Turn with me back to Romans chapter 8, verse 16 and 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him 
in order that we may also be glorified with him. We'll come back next week to the latter part of that line. But notice here that Christ is actually the main heir. And we expect that. He's the firstborn from among the dead. The inheritance goes to him. And yet, by the blessing and glory of God, we become fellow heirs. We share in Christ's inheritance. What is that? Eternal life. We share in the exaltation. We share in enjoying God forever. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 through 14. Ephesians chapter 1. If you're in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 through 13 and 14, you'll find this. In Him, in Jesus... We have obtained an inheritance. What have we obtained? An inheritance. Having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. We inherit because we are children of God. And that's all just from our Roman context. When Paul is writing these words, these things are assumed in the ancient Roman context and they're plopped down in Scripture. And we find these great truths about being estranged from our spiritual family of origin, the kingdom of darkness, and brought in to the kingdom of Christ. We find that all of our debts are canceled. We find that we become uh, uh, obtainers of an inheritance that we are not worthy to receive. And yet God has made us worthy, for he has purchased us for a price. But that's not all. One of the reasons why the ESV translates their sons of God and then children of God later, is because there's a definite and certain Old Testament context that is drawn upon. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. In Exodus chapter 4, Moses is on his way back to Egypt. And this is a very interesting passage. We don't have time for all of it. But here's God's instructions to, Pharaoh, to, to Moses about what he is to um, do and say to Pharaoh. And in Exodus chapter 4, verses 22, this is what he says. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. So what's happening here? Well, God is claiming the nation of Israel as his son. What does that mean? The chosen people of God are related to, uh, are brought in by God to be his children, to be his son. And what we find then as we link more texts is that Jesus Christ is going to sum up and fulfill the entire mission and identity of Israel in himself as son of God, true son of God. So the rest of the chosen people of God follow Jesus into this status and receive the inheritance. 
Turn with me to one more place, Hosea chapter 1. It's fascinating because Paul is going to link us being sons of God and children of God. But Hosea also has some things to say about the children of God, which are then also applied to Jesus. All right. Here we go. Hosea chapter 1, verse 10. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. What do we find there? That child theme, the chosen people of God being called children. Turn with me to Hosea chapter 10. Hosea chapter, I'm sorry, Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. This will be much more familiar to your ears because it's used at Christmas time. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. What's amazing about this text is it's actually used by Matthew in talking about the journey that Joseph, Mary, and Jesus make to Egypt and then come back. And Matthew is saying, this is clear evidence that Jesus is my son, well and good and true. And indeed, indeed, Jesus is God's son, and Jesus fulfills the mission of Israel. But now also it's linked through this childhood theme to what? To us as children of God. How were we called out of Egypt? Egypt is the kingdom of darkness. Under a tyrant, Pharaoh, or spiritually the devil. And we are called out into a new family to move to the promised land. What do we sing? Um, I think it was the song, um, When the Storms of Life Are Raging. Right? We just sung that. What's the last line? When my death is drawing near and I'm about to cross chilly Jordan. Well, the reference there is meant to be crossing as the people of God threw death into the promised land. That's the metaphor there. And so we too as children of God have received this great inheritance of crossing Chile Jordan, of crossing death into eternal life. You see, that phrase of adoption is so rich. Being children of God, fellow heirs with Christ. So what does the Holy Spirit do? In our text, our Holy Spirit, if we turn back to Romans chapter 8, the Holy Spirit is going to be doing several things for us in regards to adoption. Number one, he's going to lead us, according to verse 14, into greater righteousness. We'll come back to that next week. Number two, it is only by the Spirit that we cry, Abba, Father, It is the Holy Spirit who gives us that intimacy with God. Number three, the Holy Spirit in verse 16 bears witness that we are, that with our spirit, that we are indeed fact children of God. God himself confirms in us by the power of the Holy Spirit that we are children. Why? Because we, if we have received the Spirit of God, that we are indeed a child of God. And as the text in Ephesians says, the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of that inheritance. So what do we do? How does this apply? How does being a child of God affect my life in real time? The first thing it should do is draw us into an ever greater intimacy with God. 
Here's the thing. Spend time with God, our Father, knowing that He is your Father as you are in Christ. The Father speaks by His Holy Spirit through His Word. We must spend time in prayer, in adoring God and adoring God and in His Word. To do otherwise is like saying you love your spouse, but instead of coming home for dinner in the evenings, you head to the bar. No spouse will stand for such actions. I shouldn't say it, make that such a declaration, um, but you know what I, I hope you pick up on what I mean, right? No spouse will feel loved if instead of coming home for dinner, you head to the bar. Love comes out in action. If you are a child of God, spend time with him. Spend time with him. Second, how do you relate with God? Do you relate to him as a distant entity? Just examine yourself for a moment. Do you ever address God as Father, or is it always distant, impersonal, and never with any emotion or heart to it? Are you ever grateful for your Heavenly Father, or is it always simply a business transaction? Is it always, well, I, I call myself a Christian, so i got to check off my prayer. If your relationship with God is always distant and formal without any heart in it, you have reason to question your salvation. Our relationships with our own earthly fathers didn't always have emotions connected with them, but I bet there is a lot of emotion underlying the relationship. In our relationship with God, our Father, there should be a ton of gratitude, at least. We should feel it on occasion, at least. There should be times of deep sorrow where we're going before God and we're crying out and going, Father, I hate my sin and I'm so sorry. There should be anguish and sorrow over it. Because we have wronged the one we love and have displeased the one that we please. We want to please, I should say. There should be repentance. There should be joy. My God, what an inheritance you have given me in Christ. We should, be, we should at least on occasions feel it. We should feel love. At least on occasions the feeling of love should be on us. We should have all sorts of emotions in our relationship with God. You know, the Westminster Catechism famously begins with this question. What is the highest and chief end of man? And the answer to that question is this. The chief and highest end of man is to glorify God and to fully enjoy Him forever. Have you ever thought about that? The, the great Westminster divines, as they're thinking about this, and they're thinking about the purpose of the human life, they're thinking about what do we believe as children. They go, well, we should glorify God. That's from front to end in the Bible. But the second most important point is that we fully enjoy Him forever. Is there enjoyment in our relationship with God? That's the, that's the point. We are His children. We enjoy Him. And I'm not trying to rebuke or, or scream here. I'm just really excited like this is the thing. Enjoy God. Enjoy your relationship with Him. So what if we don't feel it? Well, I'll just be honest, many times we may not. But on occasion, there should be. 
And so what if we aren't feeling it? Then here's the thing that, that I'm going to suggest to you. If you're never feeling emotion in your relationship with God, go all in. The issue is most likely not that you are all in for God and never have good and pleasing times with him. Most likely, the issue is that we are running halfway or even on empty and don't feel anything in response. Take your time. Be with God. Go all in and the rest will follow. Someone once said, the cure for exhaustion is wholeheartedness. I'd say the same about dryness. The cure for dryness is wholeheartedness in it. The beautiful prayer that was read earlier brings that to mind, right? It's help me by faith fully become the person I was meant to be. Go all in. And third and greatest and most important for our application as children of God is doxology. Doxology is the blessing and praising of God. Our ultimate role and response as children of God is to cry out glory to God. We praise him for his deeds and for the salvation he gives us. We rejoice and praise him that we are children of God. What a miracle! So I say to you, rejoice in being a child of God if you are in the faith. And praise God for the Holy Spirit's role in bringing us in intimacy to God. Let's pray. Father, we delight in you. We thank you. We are so incredibly thankful for what Jesus has done. And we so long and wait for that day when all things are made new. Father, make us to know your ways. Help us to walk in deeper paths of intimacy, in greater holiness, and in greater love with you. In the strong and precious name we pray. Amen.